Chapter 20, Captain, July 1916. Timothy, having just returned from three years in Panama, $596 richer from digging canal mud with a pick and shovel and a mule drag team, found Charlie Bottle beneath the sizzling tin roof of Market Square, between Kromprinsden's Gade and Torfstrada. He was playing checkers. Charlie, toothless as a day-old chipmunk, thinning hair as white as the inside of a turnip, had turned 80 the year past. He soon became aware that Timothy was standing there two feet away and looked up, smiling a little. Viva didn't get ya, huh? That was his only greeting. Malaria had sent several hundred Virgin Island canal workers to early graves over in Panama. Timothy smiled back at his old friend and shook his head. Between me and the mosquitoes, they lost. Barely. He'd almost died over there from the high fever. He bent down to hug Charlie Bottle, who was as near to a father as Timothy ever had. In the shade of the open-air market stalls, a half-dozen checkerboards were occupied by men more or less Charlie's age. They gathered daily to talk and smoke and see who could be best at checkers. Vegetables, fruit, and fish were laid out on wooden tables nearby. Chattering women guarded them, shooing flies. July heat had turned Charlotte et Mali into a humid furnace. Charlie introduced his checker partner, Mr. Alonzo Lockhart. He looked to be as old as Charlie, skinny, shiny, bald head tucked down between his shoulder blades. Timothy didn't remember Mr. Lockhart. He from Tortola, Charlie explained. One of them British boys are running from a wife. Charlie cackled, his gums showing. It was good to see Charlie bottle again. Timothy hadn't been sure he'd still be alive. Most of the other pe older people from his boyhood were gone, and three more years away from St. Thomas hadn't helped that situation. Before going to Panama, he crewed on Down Island schooners, living aboard them to save money. How old you now, boy? Charlie asked, squinting up, frowning. Forty-something, Timothy replied, sitting down on the stone wall beside the market walkway. Pushing fifty, I guess. But he was still lean. His forearm muscles looked as hard as the stone on which he sat. Even his neck was heavily muscled. Pick and shovel work. Now you buck. Time you settle down, Charlie advised. Get yourself a woman. Chillin'. Timothy made a laughing noise deep in his throat. Men who went to sea didn't make good husbands, and to sea was where he intended to go. Alonzo Lockhart made three quick jumps with his red piece, and Charlie, having paid more attention to Timothy than to the game, howled in protest. Timothy said, Charlie, between what I got in the bunk here and what I made in Panama, I finally got enough to buy me a boat. Charlie regarded Timothy with surprise and whistled softly. Come on, you got a fortune, a fortune. Buy some cows, I say. Don't buy no boat. Charlie had sold his 20-cow dairy when gathering... Hay had become too much for him. Timothy thought he could buy a good schooner or sloop for 800 Over the years, he saved up $906. He'd used the 106 to live on until he could get cargoes and passengers, buy rice and beans, get her ship shape. I'm buying a boat. Charlie shook his head. He is stubborn as that old donkey I buried last year. He died saying no. Timothy nodded, smiling widely. Maybe he was donkey stubborn. It had taken him almost 30 years to gather the money, but he knew there were black men who didn't have 10 kroner in the bank. You're about to look at Captain Timothy. Don't hang your katako too high, said Charlie, eyeing Timothy. Charlie was beginning to sound like Taunt Hannah. God bless her. Well, Timothy wasn't hanging his basket too high. He'd been going to sea 30 years and could sail on any ship afloat. Finish your game and I'll buy you a rum. I need to talk, Charlie. Glancing down at the board, Charlie said, That won't be too long. Only two of his checkers remained. Mr. Lockhart made his last jump and Charlie said, A good morning to you, and rose up. A moment later, Timothy walked slowly up Sandy Torv Strada beside the old man, Charlie using his cane to maintain balance. Timothy needed Charlie Bottle to make his deal. Charlie couldn't read, 
could read and write, somewhat, taught by a woman from the Lutheran church long ago. He was also good at figures. They soon sat down for a glass of rum. The next day, Timothy said to Charlie Bottle, Does her, pointing to a two-masted wooden hulled schooner riding at anchor in Vesup Bay on the east end of the island. A for-sale sign was tacked at the base of her foremast. Her name was Tessie Crab, built in Granada. Salt streaks had turned her white paint brownish in places. She needed work, but she looked sound. Of course, Timothy couldn't tell until he careened her at low tide and looked for worms. She was 49.6 feet long and 15.7 in breadth. She belonged to the widow Tessie Crab, wife of the late Captain Elias Crab. She'd been at anchor for almost a year. Her bottom was dirty. How much she want? Charlie Bottle asked. They were standing on the beach at Vesup. A thousand, Timothy replied, eyes narrowed against the glare of the sun staring at the Tessie Crab. More than I wanted to pay. A thousand, Charlie repeated, as if there wasn't that much money in the whole of St. Thomas. But the bod part is, she let in the Bank of Denmark sell it, cause she owed a bank two hundred. Captain Crab left her with that debt. Charlie Bottle blinked and frowned. And you want me to talk to the bank? I want you to lend me two hundred dollar. Then sit by me when I talk to the bank. You didn't say this yesterday. I'm saying it today. Charlie Bottle stared at Timothy. Two hundred. That is a lot of money. How are you going to pay me back? A little at a time, Timothy said. Maybe... Ten cent, ten a month. As soon as I start getting cargo and passengers, Charlie looked back at the schooner. Suppose she got rotten sails. Them sails number four duck cloth, good as new. Suppose that hull rotten, Charlie said. I'm gonna careen her tomorrow. Look for rot and wormholes. Charlie kept looking at the Tessie crab. Suppose them frame rotten. Frames made of white oak. At a hundred years, unless I pile her up on a reef. Riggin, said Charlie, trying to find an excuse. Roblin's best wire. Charlie blew out her breath. Cockin? That kept her from leaking. Two threads cotton, five oakum, hossed well buck, and paid with pitch. Oh, you know so much, Timothy, Charlie snorted. Timothy laughed long and hard. Cause I've been going to sea since I was fourteen. Your memory give out, Charlie. Charlie shook his head. All right. You have to sign me a paper. You buck fifteen percent interest. Timothy shrugged. He had no idea what fifteen percent interest would be. It didn't matter. So long as the hull was sound, he wanted this schooner to fulfill his dream. On August fourteenth, nineteen sixteen, the former Tessie Crab now renamed Hennegums, home port St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, put out to sea past Rupert Rock and Mullenfinnels Point, turning south off Buck Island, with eight passengers and a mix of cargo bound for St. John's Antigua. It would be a typical voyage. One lady was taking bags of seed, fertilizer, thread, soap, cotton materials, and live chickens, all for sale in Antigua. On the return trip, Timothy knew he'd have two tons of charcoal, the same of firewood, then some road oil and fresh fruits. Standing at her wheel near the taffrail, the rail over her stern, steering her was Timothy, a huge grin on his face. On his head was a cap, gift a Charlie bottle. The gold thread letters said, Captain. Chapter 21, Awakening. I seemed to be swimming through warm cotton as I slowly woke up. Nearby voices sounded as if they were coming out of a tunnel. Tongue thick, mouth parched, I could still smell the ether. The back of my head hurt and I was very tired, but I knew I was alive. I hadn't died on the operating table. Mother's voice said, Philip, you're okay. It's all over. Her hand clutched mine. The doctor said it went fine. They repaired all the veins, my father's voice. They told me later that my first words were, 
Where's Timothy? Then I drifted back into the warm cotton for a while, voices fading out as I floated away again. I wanted to float away, and I remember doing that several times, like I was surfacing, then sinking again. Finally, my body seemed to stay put in that room, and I asked what time it was. 9.25, my father said. In the morning? No, it's night, mother said. You came out of the operating room at 4.15 this afternoon. I still can't see, I said, my voice sounding feeble. Remember, the doctor told you it might take several weeks. The nerves have to heal, my father said. I tried to nod my head, but realized it was strapped down, so my cheek was against the bed sheet. Why is my head this way? So you don't put pressure on the back of it, another voice said. I'm Eileen, your special nurse. I was thirsty and asked her for water. Someone put a straw into my mouth. I never felt so weak in all my life. I drifted off again, not wanting to talk. The next time I woke up, I heard the voice of another stranger asking if I needed anything. She said she was Helen, another special nurse, staying in the room with me. I asked what time it was. Just past midnight. I'd been on the table ten hours, she said. I stayed awake a little longer, then went back into that warm place where I was hiding. Later, Eileen told me that was, uh, that was a natural reaction to the surgery and to spending a long time under ether. I think I slept up to the time a strong hand was squeezing mine and the gruff voice of Dr. Pohl was saying, Good morning! I don't know about you, but... I've got to go down to the cafeteria and have my breakfast. How do you feel? It took a moment to answer him. Like I hit a rock wall. You did, but your temperature is normal, blood pressure is normal, you're doing fine so far. I'm going to shine a light in your eyes. Tell me what you see. I waited. See anything? Nothing. That's okay. I didn't expect a miracle. Give it time. He gave me a slap on the leg and said, I'll come by again late this afternoon. Meanwhile, get some food in your belly. Two days later, Dr. Pohl said, The incision is healing nicely. No sign of infection. He lifted the bandage on the back of my head, and the nurse was standing by to put another fresh one on. You're doing fine. The next six days were the longest in my life. I kept hoping I'd see light of some kind, even dim light. But that darkness I'd lived in since April showed no signs of lifting. Each day, the doctor would come in and make his test with a tiny flashlight, and each time, my answer was the same. He wasn't much comfort. He remained gruff and once said, I don't try to win friends around here. I said I didn't guarantee you'd see again. Let nature work. I cried several times after he left, giving up hope. My parents came twice a day to read to me and tell me what they'd been doing on outside. They tried to keep my spirits up, but we ran out of things to talk about. Although Dr. Pohl had said it might take two weeks to notice any results, I kept thinking the operation had failed. I wouldn't go through it again. <laughs>